across the state of Wyoming. Axel Garcia is here taught as a speaker yesterday, I believe. He is an irrigation specialist at the research station. Abdel Mezba is a research scientist at the research station, and he works on um, high tunnel research in connection with Wyoming Business Council. So let's look at some high tunnels. This is a picture of the ones out, three of them out at the research station. This is a basic hoop design, 32 feet long and about 12 feet wide. This is a straight sided one where you have vertical walls on the sides. It is 32 feet long, but it's uh, 16 feet wide. And then we have the Gothic style here where the roof is slanted and then makes a bend. And the Gothic style is 32 feet long, but it's 17 feet wide. So they're all three are the same length. These were originally built so that they could do research and compare the different styles. You can see these anytime by going out to the Powell Research Station. Uh, you can t uh, go in the office there and tell Kathy you'd like to see them, and somebody will take you out and show them to you. Okay, so what is a high tunnel? Well, you've heard about greenhouses. You've seen greenhouses. They're kind of fancy. They have glass, or they have uh, plastic, poly polymer plastics. They generally have heating elements. You have one at this campus that has a gas heater. It has a cooling system in it. A greenhouse costs a lot of money per square foot. And it can have a concrete base as well, as well as all the metal racks and, and trays inside a greenhouse. So a greenhouse has cost a lot. High tunnels were specifically designed to be inexpensive, something that a homeowner uh, could put up or a commercial person could put up that would extend the season both in the spring and in the fall, give you a little bit more protection. So. Uh, these are pictures from all across the country. Do you think this one would survive in Wyoming? I see a lot of smiles out there. No, probably wouldn't take our win. So we actually have some specialized construction points uh, that would make them last in Wyoming. So the idea is that it's inexpensive. You can build it yourself. Uh, it can um, extend the season. Uh, and so that's basically it. There's nothing fancy added into a high tunnel. A lot of them are tall enough to stand in. You can have trellised crops. These just happen to be up on stakes, but also you can have a vertical trellis and run things up. No standard dimensions other than the lumber that you want to build it with, where you want to maximize the efficiency of your lumber and you have to cut pieces and waste, waste wood. So these are some to look at in the wintertime. You do get some snow on top that can block sunlight on some of the designs. Um, there's one with a lot of snow. How do they hold up in this? I wonder if I'm here actually grow stuff in there. Do they actually retain heat? Or okay, I have, I have some pictures and we'll, I actually have graphs of the heat differences from inside and outside. We'll get to those. Uh, the snow does block the light and you do have to be able to support that weight. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's what it looks like inside. So this plastic material, the material, um, the particular material that Jeff has used on all of the Wyoming workshops that he's done, that particular material transmits, um, I don't know if they say here, but most of them they'll transmit between 55 to 
to about 80% of the light. And this material transmits about 80% of the daylight, of the solar light coming through. And then you put snow on top, and you know you're getting a lot less. So you can see in here, they have not attempted to grow anything in midwinter. So something to think about is, OK, well, they extend the season. Are they supposed to extend the season for three, six, 365 days? The answer to that is no, not really. They're designed to extend it in the spring, maybe a month, and in the fall, a month. But without any additional stuff inside there to help with heat retention, they're not designed to carry you over the midwinter in January. You just stop growing things. And sometimes that can be a positive. Why would it be positive if you didn't have anything growing in there for a month or two? What would be good about that? Could you break some pest cycles? Maybe your insects would die. Some diseases would go dormant. And you could clean them out. So there's, there can be good things about not being operational in the winter. So those are the three we talked about at the station. Here's the simple hoop style. Uh, this is lap. Uh, the door is uh, plywood with a wood frame behind it. Uh, it's about nine feet high at the top. And the materials for this one, 32 feet long, are about $1,200. So you're looking at something that somebody could afford to build. And then you would have, uh, that doesn't include labor, that's just materials. So then you invite a bunch of friends over for potluck supper for three days and you get it built. So actually, going back to this one, we built all three of those in three days, but we had a crew of 50 people. So it's possible to build them quickly uh, with help. Okay, this is the inside, nine feet tall. Uh, you can run, this is set up to run sprinklers off the top, but you could set it up for drip irrigation. Have, and you want to have your water plumbed on the inside so that you could do drip irrigation or whatever you wanted to do. Here's a Dubois one. Uh, Jeff has now built 50 of these statewide, 50 high tunnels of different styles in different workshops. Douglas. Here's the Gothic style. So the Gothic style has the ability to use this PVC pipe to roll up the plastic up to here, and then you lock it up there, and that way you vent the top of the greenhouse. Because in, in the, the high tunnel, in summer, your temperatures are going to get really hot in there. So hot sometimes you don't even want to walk in with the door shut. So you can open it up and vent it. You can leave it open all summer long, uh, depending on what crops you have in there. There's no need to have a high tunnel closed all the time. And we have two experts sitting here in the front row. Let me introduce Bob Perkle on the left. Bob is Master Gardener and President of Chairman of the State Master Gardener Association, and he's worked at the high tunnels at the research station for many years. Justine Christman is the new research assistant out there, and she has personally crawled every square foot of these, right? <laughs> okay, so they do get very, very hot. Um, and so one of our questions was, what happens to the light transmittance when you have different shapes of high tunnels? So you have a, a different surface here. Um, and I think the next will show you the inside. One of the advantages here is that you can walk up right to the edge of the high tunnel and you can stand. And you, can have, you could have a bench in there if you wanted to. Or you could walk in there and deal with crops that are in some beds here. That hoop one curves down, and it's hard to get right next to the edge of the wall. So just in terms of access, it's different. Here it is with the venting open. Nice and light, lots of air moving through there. And in the summertime, you would even have the doors open. There are pests that love to come into high tunnels. And so you might want to have some chicken wire, rabbits, uh, skunks. Um, Mice, a lot of mice. We, we have to run traps in here. Bob's got record catches. <laughs> so something to think about is when you, as soon as you open the door, you have other critters who are trying to come in and eat that wonderful lettuce or that wonderful tomato plant that you've got there. Um, so that's the way of venting. Uh, here is the regular uh, straight side. 
and this is four foot tall. Again, it allows you to walk up inside to the edge of the high tunnel and actually have a bench there or be able to walk up and harvest things. And this one again rolls up to give you a lot of air. That's what that one looks like inside. And that's what it can look like when it's in use. So, you know, if you're dealing with handicapped people or people in wheelchairs, you could, they could come in and use a raised bench like that pretty easy. So, Jeff Edwards is a person and his contact information will be at the end. Wyoming Department of Agricultural Grants, they have money available to build high tunnels. And I have a limited number of, I just have one each. They have a community garden grant that people can apply for. They have a producer high tunnel season extension grant, and uh, people can apply for that money. It's matching money. The minimum amount that they will give you is 500. The maximum is 3,500. So when you hear that number 3,500, that will help pay for most of the construction costs of a high tunnel. And then if you're a, a nonprofit organization, such as Master Gardeners or a church or something, they have another high tunnel grant for nonprofit organizations. And um, I only have brochures here for the nonprofit. Um, so there's Wyoming Department of Ag money available, and I know they still have money in there. They built one at the State Fair in 2011. It was a rousing success, uh, exposed a lot of people in the state to high tunnels. So these numbers are old. Uh, they have now built 50, uh, 50 high tunnels. <coughs> These are some of the locations as you travel around the state, you actually could find some to look at if that's what you wanted to do. Um, and Jeff Edwards is actually looking for someone who would like to ramrod the high tunnel construction project and be the traveling workshop person. He's looking for someone to hire to do that. He would train them. So what about the impact or the performance of high tunnels? We have some basic information now on air temperature, soil temperature, relative humidity, humidity, light quality, and some information on crop performance. This is about the third year that we've had science being conducted in high tunnels by the University of Wyoming faculty. And I have a little bit of that over here. Uh, like I said, this is science results. This report here is from uh, Axel Garcia, what he saw in terms of climate. And those, for those of you who were late, the front row is all handouts, okay? So pick them up. Uh, so we're gonna look at some of this. One of the big questions, um, so we're looking at, the red is air temperature uh, in high tunnel two. So high tunnel one is the hoop, <coughs> high tunnel two is the straight sides, high tunnel three is the gothic. So we're looking at high tunnel to the straight sided one. Red is air temperature, black is soil temperature inside it. The time period is from June uh, to July. So one month, about one month of time. This is when we first got them and I, I got some uh, environmental uh, recording data uh, instruments in each one of them. And so look what's happening. The air temperature inside the high tunnel, the red line here is the point at which it's about 85 degrees, the point at which tomatoes will stop growing. It's too hot. It's the temperature at which pollen becomes sterile and you don't have any tomatoes set. So the air temperature is getting way up there. I mean, this is 110. 110 on some of those days in, in June. Here's July 3rd. And then look at what's happening. And there's a big variation day and night between air temperature. But you look at a much smaller amplification in soil temperature. It's not changing. It's not fluctuating as much. It's not going as high. It's not going as low. So the high tunnel is protecting that soil. And it would do that naturally outside as well. But, but in the high tunnel, we can really see a big difference. Any questions? Sandy, were the sides rolled up or down when that was measured? Um, they would have all been down. Yeah. At that time, we didn't have any plants in them. Okay. I don't did we that first year, very first year. Maybe we did. We did. We did. But I think we only opened doors. I right. Don't, I don't even remember. 
Uh, That's a big issue, but we only opened the doors. Right. This is just to July 8th. I don't know if we had anything planned in July to that time period. Okay, so now we're looking at the little hoop house, tunnel one. Air temperature is black this time, sorry, and soil temperature is red, and it's in degrees centigrade. So air temperature, wow, look at the variation. And soil temperature, the variation. This is from July, July, August, September, October, November, December, January 2011. So in the fall, both temperature sets are decreasing. Um, soil temperature is not in uh, July and August. It's still going up and down quite a bit when it's hot and cold, hot and cold. But then as the air temperature starts cooling, and it, it doesn't really, I think nighttime temperatures are probably more important than daytime temperatures as we cool off. But then we cool way down and soil temperature drops down. So here's centigrade is zero is 32 Fahrenheit center. So that's 32 Fahrenheit. It's still a little bit above 32 in the soil temperature in that small tunnel. Light intensity. Well, we didn't know what was going to happen with light intensity, so we're, we're measuring it in <coughs> lumens per square foot. And this is actually, all this really shows you is day and night. And every day, pretty much, it got to the same level. And maybe there was a cloudy day here and a cloudy day, some cloudy days here. But basically it went all the way up and all the way down every day. We didn't know what we were gonna see when we put that in there. All right, this is one of Axel's um, charts. And what we're looking at here is air temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit. Here is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we're looking at a month of data, September, November, December. September, October, November, December. So the air temperatures are dropping. Internal, external, let's see. So they're looking at the minimum, the daily minimums, to try and figure out, okay, is this going to extend our season or not? And what he found out is between these two red lines, what he found out is that in the fall, if you're looking at 32 degrees in the fall, he thought that the, uh, the temperatures, the internal daily minimum, the red line, stayed above 32 for about an extra 13 days. So he felt that that high tunnel uh, worked added an extra 13 days to the growing season in the fall without anything else, without doing anything else to it, no artificial heating. So this was Axel's conclusion. Uh, it did protect the crops from early frost. You know, our typical frost day here in, um, frost day, here in PAL is uh, September 15th. Um, and our spring frost, uh, latest frost is May 22nd. So uh, an extra 13 days, it protected them from those frosts and it gave an extra 13 days of growing. Um, so. So I have a question. Yeah. If you were able to have raised beds and you had a system where it heated your soil up, but not the air temperature, would the air temperature like, be able to stay warm enough that the soil could stay at a constant temperature to even grow even longer? That's a good question, and actually, uh, the answer is probably yes. And they are researching that down in Laramie. Uh, that's part of the ongoing research right now down at the Laramie Research Station and the Acres Farm that the students have. They have five high tunnels down there, all the same, and the hoop style. And they're in each one, they have a different kind of um, passive heat collection system. One of them is going to be a compost pile. One of them is um, some other things. Mom, you want to talk about that? Um, that is actually uh, true. In Torrington, they have uh, two raised beds that are built out of cinder blocks. Mm -hmm. and depending upon the angle of the sun, it heats up those cinder blocks. And so they are able to, for example, um, two years ago, they were, um, on Christmas Eve, they were eating fresh tomatoes that they grew. But that was out of that raised tunnel. Out here in Powell, we can go out there today and we can um, uh, 
the soil is warm, it's 30 some degrees mm -hmm. in there, and outside it may be freezing, but, uh, but seeds will not germinate until you get above 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so that's the problem with uh, transplanting versus seeding. You have to, if you're going to seed, you better, uh, temperature, soil temperature is paramount. Good question, yeah. So, any kind of thermal mass. I mean, I had a, used to have a, I had a passive solar gr greenhouse on my house, and I just had black water barrels, and they kept it really hot all the time. So, Are you anything. Anything with like GMO thermal heating? Was it like water being pumped down into the ground or anything? Okay. Uh, Keep in mind, greenhouse versus high tunnel, and the expense versus inexpensive. Okay, if you want to go the greenhouse route, you can put geothermal into your concrete floor. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a high tunnel, you only want to spend no more than $2,000 to get the system up and going. Totally different mindset. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can apply as much technology as you want. And in fact, a lot of the research now, I, I have to laugh because they're all adding technology to high tunnels and upping the cost when that was, was not the whole point of the thing, you know. But it's interesting. It's just interesting. So simple technology that can increase your time, your temperatures is to put row covers on your crops inside. In December, January, February, you might have extra row covers in there. And again, how much light gets through is important as well. So the, those row covers will add a little insulation. So here's soil temperature. Now he's talking about minimum soil temperatures. And this is in Fahrenheit. So here's... Uh, Okay, so he's looking at the daily minimum outside, uh, the inside, interior daily minimum, exterior daily minimum. And then he correct calculates a line for each one of them. So what's important is that um, there is a, the exterior daily minimum outside in the soil, outside the high tunnels, always a lot colder than the soil inside the high tunnels. And that was a question we had, because if the small hoop house was only 12 by 32, that's 12 feet. That's a narrow feet, narrow distance to try to insulate by putting something over it. So we didn't know if it was going to work or not, really. So seed germination and plant growth, Bob talked about that. If you picked up the handouts, uh, you have one that here that is uh, soil temperatures for seed germination. And if you put your seeds in the ground before those temperatures, uh, you're really exposing your seed to a lot of potential rot, to a lot of fungal pathogens, bacteria, and critters in the soil that might eat it before it actually germinates. Um, so that's one of the temperatures. So yes, it can stay at 40, uh, it can stay at 40, uh, but if you get below 40 for your soil temperature, growth will be very slow, and germination might not happen. You have to match the crop. From January to July in one year, uh, Axel looked at the data, and the winter inside temperatures were 10 to 12 degrees warmer than the outside temperatures. In the summer, they were 2 to 3 degrees warmer. And I have to say that's with the doors open. And then uh, the relative humidity, that's what that is. The relative humidity was higher in the winter than in the summer. That's something we don't necessarily think about is how much moisture is in that high tunnel. But as soon as you fill it with plants and they're transpiring water and you're irrigating in there, you build up a high humidi humidity and you could be subject to pathogens, the fungal stuff, powdery mildew, those kinds of things. So you have to think about that. Uh, and in the winter, that humidity can condense on the surface of the high tunnel as well, inside on the cold wall, and then drip down on your plants. And that's a negative, too. You don't really want that water, cold water, dripping on your plants. So the average soil temperature he found in the winter was 37, and in the summer it was 70, just the average, averages from that early research. Inside air temperature in the winter, wow, look at that variation from minus three to 75 in the winter. Uh, the light intensity was higher in the sidewall style, and the summer light intensity was similar in all three styles, no significant differences. Soil temperature, uh, 
January to July vary from 26 to 38. So that's not much variation, but still below anything very many of the plants would like. Um, for, and that's an average, so you know you take that into account. That's average. That's probably January. You had both extremes in the hoop style, and the soil in the Gothic style had less variation. Well, think about it, okay? The Gothic style was 17 feet wide, so it was five feet wider than the small hoop style, and it just protected more uh, of the soil in terms of distance from, from the outside soil temperature coming in. This is Jeff, if you might want to write these down. He loves to get phone calls, uh, emails, and this is his website, which we actually could go to uh, for uh, Wyoming uh, Hoop House Information Network. Uh, it's really great. Um, and then I have a bunch of things I'd like to talk about, too. Um, this new recent magazine, uh, Extension Connection with Wyoming, the Connect magazine, has an article about Jeff and the Wyoming Business Council and all of their projects that they've had. Um, the information on construction uh, on this table is all up to date and a lot of it is straight off of Jeff's website. Um, the information here, uh, typically these that look like this are from the Utah State University. They are way ahead of us in terms of research in high tunnels. They have a lot of high tunnels in Logan. Uh, they do a lot of research. I would recommend their website as well for more information about high tunnels. And um, the temperature information, one of the sheets is called Cardinal Temperatures. These uh, can tell you the temperatures that you need for growing, the optimum temperatures that you need for growing different vegetables. And on the back, it talks about day length. And this becomes important in terms of hours of sunlight that you're going to have in each month. So we're looking at day length at 45 degrees north. That's approximately where Powell is. And in February, the 16th of February, that's next, you know, three weeks away, we will have 10.18 hours of daylight. And then you go all the way into June, and so that would be the solstice in June and that would be 15.4 hours of daylight. So hours of daylight key into what your plant growth will be, as well as temperature. And then over here, um, just this uh, report by Axel Garcia. It's really worth reading because he talks about uh, more recent research on the high tunnels, on the air temperatures and things like that. So I have plenty of time for questions or discussion about high tunnel. Has anybody here built a high tunnel yet? Who wants to? Who's going to build one? Oh, good. A couple. Okay. Well, what kinds of, what questions would you have about high tunnels? The last time I did this, the room was full of people who were about to build them. So <laughs> what, what kind of questions do you have? I guess my main is the wind. What do you do to you know? All right. Jeff specifically told me to mention that uh, not a single one of these 50 uh, high tunnels has blown down. And what they do is they have an extra strap on the outside. I can actually describe the um, construction a lot better. Okay. Can you go back to pictures? Let's go back to like the first one. Do that. Yes, and they have not come down at all. The Gothic style is, is anchored in the ground with concrete, <coughs> four corners. Yeah. That's the only one, the middle one. Right. So they all have uh, they all have rebar, uh, 18 inches of rebar in the ground at every one of these ribs. There's rebar down in the ground, and then the PVC pipe goes, and the rebar sticks up at an angle. And the PVC pipe goes over that rebar. And then the doorways, the posts are set in the ground in concrete, down in the ground about three to two, three feet. And then in between, you can see this little dip here, in between each rib, there's a strap which comes down and is um, fastened to the bottom of the greenhouse here. So the material is held down onto the ribs. So there's no flapping, nothing like that. These have been up for three years. We do have some problems. 
uh, typically right along the edge here where the wind, this is the west coming towards those high tunnels, and along the edge here we've had some of it pull away. And that's because the, uh, the over, extra overlap was cut too short and it just worked its way out from the wire that was securing it. Um, other than that, there haven't been any problems. Sandy, I have a question. Out of those 50 that haven't blown away, like the ones at the station are, are built with a, a shelter belt to the north. Yes. So how many of those other 50 that, are they all with shelter belts or no, some of them are? Of just out in the middle of nothing. Out in the middle of nothing. Uh, and so that brings up another question about orientation and site choosing as well. So if you want to choose a site for your high tunnels, you're going to use whatever soil is there. That's what your baby's going to be, unless you do a raised beds. And so you want to pick a site that has good soil. You want to be close to a water source, because you're going to have to plumb something into these high tunnels. Um, you want to make it convenient for you, so that you will go out there and open doors and open vents and do what has to be done every day. Um, you also want to think about uh, do I want it north, south, or east, west? That question comes up all the time. These happen to be sited east, west. And this is the north where the wooden break is. Um, and so this is facing due south, this whole surface here. Jeff has not made any, hasn't decided on any hard and fast rules whether they should be east, west, north, south. The one, the five new ones down at Laramie on the campus are just like this. They're angular. They're linearly on the east-west axis with their big face, the big uh, sun-catching side facing south. So you can, you can make your own decision on that. Either way will work. Bob, is there anything you'd like to add about high tunnel? In a less than 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um. We didn't talk about plants at all. The only thing that I would preface is that, um, as Sandy mentioned, these are season extenders. But a lot of people want to get in a hurry in the spring and start planting. But soil temperature is so important. If you put seeds in the ground, as she has mentioned, when it's less than 40 degrees, you're going to be wasting your, your money buying seeds because they will rot. We planted a seed, the lettuce seed last year, it sat there and sat there, and it would not germinate until it got 41 degrees. But in the meantime, there was other lettuce seeds, and then we had drip irrigation, so the, the conditions were conducive to rot, and so then those seeds would rot. The other thing that we did two years ago is we put, as a um, protection against the wind, we put hay bales all the way around, and that was wonderful stop the wind and everything. But it also was um, a magnet for mice. And so we planted not only lettuce, and we were wondering why the lettuce wasn't germinating, but the mice set up shop in there and they clipped them off as they were coming up. It was like candy to them. And so I would not encourage uh, any wind protection right close to a uh, high tunnel if you're thinking about uh, hay bales or anything like that. And we, in, in all three of these tunnels, there was only like um, two or three mice, but if three of them are females, they can have a litter every two weeks, and pretty soon you got hundreds of them running around. And, and um, it's frustrating to plant stuff and not have it come up because those guys are eating it as fast as it comes out of their so what's happened with plants that have been in high tunnels? Uh, in between Cody and Powell, there is Scott Richard, who has uh, a CSA and also does farmer's market with some produce out of his high tunnels. And he has been doing it now for about four years. He highly recommends high tunnels. He says the one crop in particular that they seem to be spectacular for producing quality product is peppers. And uh, I saw his peppers last year. His, his but they were like that, and they were gorgeous. So I was like, oh man, if I could ever grow one like that. So he, Scott, particularly finds them nice for peppers. Um, anyway. Also on this site here, right before that front tunnel, we have an open garden. So that is planted every year so that we can gauge the difference between 
um, what the plants are doing dug into the ground versus and then we tried to without any success to stagger the planting in each one of those tunnels every two weeks because we were trying to determine when the most optimum time to plant in those tunnels would be and um, that um, is a still worthwhile um, research project but we haven't gotten there yet and then also um, there is a greenhouse 1950s greenhouse on the research station and I grow a lot of grow out a lot of plants in there and then I will transplant them that way I can get this the stems so that they're relatively good size and they have a really nice root system so that that is advantageous to producing fruit earlier too and also we have totally abandoned long season crops. We're going to all the new research short season crops like 50 to 70 days because we live in a, in a big horn basin here and we have a lot of day length, but it heats up in the day and it gets so cool to the, in the night, it's, it's, it takes a long time to get those plants charged up again so that they start producing. And so we're having really good success with like 70 day tomatoes. And, and, pepper plants and so we're, we're trying a lot of that research um, in the greenhouse there and then transplanting them to these high tunnels. So one of the things to think about is succession planting. Exactly. In other words, if you have an extra 30 days on the front end in the spring and it's cool and your soil temperature is cool, then you can put cool season crops in there, uh, lettuce, spinach, beets, uh, broccoli, things like those can get started early. And then as the season warms up, you can harvest some of those uh, for farmer's market or whatever. They'll get done earlier than usual. You'll have them for farmer's market. Then you come in and you plant your warm season crops, your tomatoes, peppers, uh, whatever. And then you harvest those. And in the fall, in August, you can, August, September, you can start lettuce, uh, spinach, beets, uh, cabbage. You can start those again in the fall. Um, I guess one caveat I would say is that in the summer it gets so hot in the high tunnel, you, all, you, you may not need a high tunnel. They weren't designed to be closed up in the summer. You may have all the vents open, all the doors open, and uh, just leave it like that. If, if a cool night's coming, you might close it at night for a cool night. But, but think about succession planting. You're going to be planting at least twice, maybe three times during a whole long year in a high tunnel. Another point, um, everybody has heard of square foot gardening. This does not work in high tunnels because you want to have, you want to space these plants appropriately so there's a lot of air movement around because, because even though it's hot, humidity, as Sandy said, builds up in that high tunnel and that creates conditions conducive to mold and other diseases that will attack all of these plants. And then also it's a great attractant to aphids. And so if you can space these plants out, keep the air moving in there, you'll have better production and less disease problem. And then also don't plant them too close to the edge because plants need room to grow. And so a lot of people try to stuff a lot of plants in a, in a short space. And we did that in that first tunnel, the smallest one she was talking about. It was a jungle in there and we just had <laughs> disease problems that we didn't, we should have anticipated, but we didn't. We had a lot of vegetative production. We had a little fruit, very little fruit. Um, uh, you mentioned aphids, and that brings up another point about pollination in a high tunnel. You have to worry about pollination of your plants to get fruit. Uh, just remember that uh, tomatoes and peppers are self-pollinated. Uh, they're pollinated by movement. Uh, however, bees can help improve that. The wind can do it, but uh, bees and insects can help improve pollination on tomatoes and peppers. And you can establish some habitat outside your high tunnels, close by, that would be suitable for native pollinators so that they would be encouraged to fly through your high tunnel when the vents are open. Um, so you can think about that uh, if you're, some people like to grow commercial flowers in high tunnels. Well, you definitely need some pollination there if you're going to get some seed for the next year. So you would, you know, just establish a habitat for native pollinators around the outside of the high tunnel. Any questions? Have you found a higher yield in the different greenhouses are all pretty much the same? Um, we do not have data on that. Uh, we do not have good data on that yet. 
we're still in the early stages of uh, research on that. 13. And another, the other two sources that I use for cold, cold states is Vermont and Michigan. They both have high tunnel manuals with information in it. Uh, you, they're available online. You can download and read different chapters. Vermont, University of Vermont Extension and uh, Michigan State Extension. Uh, I recommend those. And then Utah State. We are still in the early stages. I think the environment in all three of those high tunnels is conducive to higher production. But again, it's um, uh, conducive on the spacing of the plants, the disease resistance of the plants, and the fertilization that you incorporate. And so in all three of these plants, we use slow release, for, or I mean in all three of these tunnels, we use slow release fertilizer. And then they're all drip irrigated. All, and Sandy mentioned that the, those high tunnels were built for, for a drip or for a sprinklers. sprinklers. But I would not recommend any sprinklers in any high tunnels or greenhouses because there you're going to have disease problems that you do not want. And so, and then the problem is once you, you get disease in a greenhouse or high tunnel, uh, it might take two seasons to get it out of there. You're going to have to have a lot of uh, spraying with bleach and you know other um, chemicals. And in the meantime, you can't be growing plants in there. So, um, but those those uh, drips. Or those uh, pipes up there are um, um, one could put hanging plants in there and put drip systems off those, and that would be a good, uh, a good thing to think about if you're um, if you're growing um, uh, horticultural plants other than vegetables. Now you've got floor space, you've got possible bench space, and you've got hanging plant space. So you've got three levels there. Just don't block the light <laughs> too much. And the other thing uh, on indeterminate plants, and an indeterminate plant means it keeps growing and growing and growing. And you may have to uh, employ some pruning methods on plants um, like uh, tomatoes in particular. Um, some of the vining type plants you're going to have to have a trellis type system. Otherwise it will just take over your greenhouse because the, the heat within those is just conducive to massive growth. And so, uh, there's a lot of factors that need to be taken into uh, so high play tunnel, here. High tunnels are labor intensive because you're going to have to check them every day. You may, can put your drip irrigation on automation on a timer, uh, but you've got to be able some sort of vent. If you need to open your doors. Now, uh, quite often, uh, Jeff will. This will be a solid piece of plywood up here with a solar powered or a, a vent, a fan that comes on based on the inside temperature. Um, so that can be set up pretty easily without, um, and it's just based on the temperature in the high tunnel, opens the vent and the fan starts going. At the state fair, they have a high tunnel that Jeff built, and then also in Torrington. And then you see those two bottom panels, clear panels on each side of the door. They have uh, reinforced those with, um, with plywood, and they put fans down there. And keeping air movement through the high tunnel is, is very, very important. So you can see, even in midsummer, it may not be the best option. You know, if your local growing conditions are good for midsummer, then uh, you know maybe you don't need to try to grow something in here in midsummer. But fall and spring would be the time you would use your high tunnel. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're done. Time to go to the next one. Pick up a handout and you.